So, as I was trying to prepare for today, I was, I was honestly really struggling with trying to figure out what I wanted to say and what God wanted me to say, or, or if what I wanted to say was what God wanted me to say. So, I was, I was praying, I was studying, just trying to focus in, and, and last week I had the opportunity to uh, go away. Uh, every September I go away with a, a couple of my buddies up to... Um, one of them has a cottage up in, in Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, it is as rustic as they come, no running water, you know, we jump in the lake every morning to clean up and everything. So no electronics and, like, other than your phone. And I just basically put my phone away for the week. And every morning I was the first one up, hopped in the lake, and then I, I sat down and I read the Bible and, you know, spent that time with God. And the, the group of us that go up there is sort of a, a mixed group. There's uh, most of us are Christians. There's a couple uh, that are not believers. And then uh, there was there was one one of my friends there last year when we were up there. He um, announced to everyone that he was no longer a Christian. He grew up in a Christian home, and in fact, he was a pastor's son. And uh, he has come to the conclusion that God is not real and that everything in the Bible is just man's mythology to try and understand what we didn't understand in the past. So last year I really, I really wanted to be able to sit and talk with him um, and, and the opportunity just didn't come. Like, I, I felt like I really needed to talk to him. I, I love to have those discussions with people and, and see where they're coming from and the opportunity didn't come. So. This year, as we were, as I was getting ready to go up, I was praying about it ahead of time. I said, "Lord, if I have the opportunity, then, then great, right?" And um, turns out, on the second or third night, and and really totally by him bringing it up, uh, we entered into a, a great conversation. Really, lasted over three hours. A, a, a debate, if you will, at different times. It involved up to four or five of us in the cabin, but there was. Him and, and uh, me and one other guy that were largely invested in this conversation for, for the majority of the time. And um, I, as I was talking to him, he brought up a lot of the same points that we hear a lot of. You, you, you can look and find studies about how often people, not, I'm not talking about the unsaved that haven't come to the Lord yet, people that grew up in the church that, that um, have a foundation that, that know the Bible and they have walked away. And it's largely in the younger generations, but not, in, not entirely. There, such a large number of people are walking away from God now. And uh, one study I was looking at uh, was it was uh, had polled some people and was looking at a bunch of the reasons why Christians are walking away from God. Um, one of them was that they, they claim to have a very shallow experience with God. They said growing up all their life going to church was boring. Okay? The Bible was not taught clearly or in some cases just not really taught at all. You know, we, you get a general message of what the Bible is about but it's not, not really taught. They didn't understand it. Um, another big, big uh, reason given was that church and science seem to be Opposite. They do not go well together. So, um, which we see in our world nowadays, I mean, we have, as a society, largely kicked God out of, out of schools, um, out of polite society. We just don't, we don't need God anymore, is, is the idea. We've, you know, solved everything on our own. We have all the answers without God. And so, science seems to be at opposition with the church, is, is one of the reasons given. And then, Obviously, another big one is the, the um, idea that how can evil exist if God is real? Those, those are, there are a couple of those, but those are three big reasons that were given. And, and as I was thinking about that study, it really got me wondering, like, are we in the church teaching the word of God, the, the full word of God properly? And, and more importantly, are we giving the reasons why we can know that this is true? Okay. And perhaps beyond that, do we ourselves know the reasons that we believe the Bible is true? 
I've talked to many people, many Christians who will say, yeah, they believe the word is true, but when you get into a deeper discussion, you say, why? What is the reason for your faith? Well, because the Bible says so, but they don't know much beyond that. Um, I want to read in Judges. I, I will, um, you'll find I have a whole lot of scripture back and forth. You don't have to turn to every passage if you don't want, but um, I, I find it better to let the Bible do the speaking than me, so I have a lot of passages that I'll be flipping back and forth with. Um, in Judges chapter 2, verse starting at verse 7, uh, and I'm going to read through, through verse 12. Um, this is at the end of Joshua's life. It says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and he was buried, uh, and they buried him within the border of his inheritance um, at Timnath, Harry's, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them, who did not know the Lord, nor the works which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. So we have, we can see that it doesn't take long for a generation to turn away from God. Okay. Joshua and the leaders at that time were serving God and had seen all the mighty works that God had done. And they knew that God was the true God, the only God. Okay? And so they served him. But when they passed away, the fallen generation didn't, they didn't know that. They didn't have that experience for themselves. They, maybe they weren't taught the things. I mean, the Bible says that we need to be always talking on the words of God. And in all our... You know, all our activities as we're walking along with each other to be speaking the words of God, okay? To always have the word on our hearts and on our minds so that we are not to stray. And then also to share that with the next generation, whether it's young people or just young in the faith who haven't yet, you know, come to the full understanding of God. We need to be constantly, always in our speech, having God as, as primary so that we are able to pass that on. Which is also another reason why I wanted to start this morning out with some testimony. Because I think it's very important in our lives that we are recognizing what God's doing in our lives, even when it's small things. And then telling our children, telling our siblings, our friends, everyone that will listen. We need to tell them what God is doing for us and what, what he's done in our lives. Because that is the, the best example that we have is what God has done for us. And all of us, when we think about it and when we really dig in, we know that God has done so much in our lives. But we don't often spend the time thinking about it. We talk in general terms, yes, he saved me, and he did. He did. But go deeper. What is he doing for you right now? Because we can use that to, um, to share with people and bring them to the Lord or to strengthen their faith if they're doubting. So about, I guess it's probably about maybe eight years ago now. Um, as actually, as Jackie said, when she was up here, you know, I, I, at Evangel, I was always sitting back in the back row. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. I always knew that, uh, you know, Christ was my salvation. I never doubted that. But there was a period of time where the things of this life just became, I guess more important to me, and I never would have admitted that out loud because I didn't think that was true, but I definitely had God on the back burner. I'd go to church every week, and I, I believed that he had saved me, but I was not living or, or serving God in any way outside of Sunday morning. And, uh, um, yeah, Chris, at one point, he had invited me out to a Wednesday night, and I had to admit to myself, I, I said, Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'll have to see if I can make it. And he says, oh, I know. It's, it's, life is busy. If you can't, that's fine. And, and I have to say to myself, well, 
that's not really true. Wednesday night I'm dropping my kids off at Kids Connection and then I'm going home to sit and watch TV. And, and I realized in that moment, it's, it's weird how God can just use a single moment like that, but it clicked for me that I, I wasn't making God a priority. And starting in that moment, I, uh, I decided to make a change. I started coming out to Wednesday nights. I started studying for myself and, and listening to uh, preachers online, learn, just learning. I started digging into the Word, into the Word of God. And that's when God really led me to um, a, a uh, topic of the, the topic of apologetics. And um, just in case anyone's unfamiliar, apologetics sometimes sometimes I say that and people don't really either know what that is or they um, have maybe a bad understanding of it. But apologetics is just a reasoned argument in defense of what you believe. Okay, it's using. Um, reasons, evidence, justification to, to explain why you believe what you believe. Um, and, and then that also, when, when you start to study and learn those reasons, you're able to answer skeptics' questions and, and understand false teachings when you, when you see them. 1 Peter 3, 14 to 15. Sorry, give me one second. says, um, but, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of the threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that you have, or the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Now, depending on the translation you have, it might say with gentleness and respect. And I was looking into that, and um, the word that's used there, I really, I really uh, think fear is the better uh, description there. The word, if you read up above, it says, "Do not be afraid of their threats." Okay, and that word "afraid" is uh, "phobeo." I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but "phobeo," uh, which would be where we get "phobia" from. Okay, and then when you get down to the bottom, um, so sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready to give a defense um, to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So with meekness is definitely to be kind and gentle and loving as we present these reasons. But fear might sound weird, but the word there is phobos, which is just another tense of the same word. And I think it's important because what we're, what, the fear is, is, is really, you know, the, the fear of God, the, the fear of handling the word properly, you know, um, understanding what he's saying, and then, and then sharing it with people because you, you want them to come to, to God and understand the reasons that you believe. So, anyways, that's just a little side note of those studying. So, um, and, and if you read, like, so that chapter in First Peter, um, he's giving, like, different directions to, you know, to husbands and to different people. But at the beginning of this section here, up in verse 8, it says, finally, all of you be of one mind. And then he continues down and then gives a direction um, to be ready to give a defense. And I believe that's because this isn't just pastors or preachers that need to be able to defend. We all need to be able to defend what we believe and explain why we believe that the Word of God is true. I said earlier that um, some people may have a bad uh, connotation when they hear the word apologetics because some say that apologetics is just um, it's just arguing, okay? And if we look at a verse like Second Timothy, okay, Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-three to twenty-four says, uh, "Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all." So that taken alone will lead some people to say we, we shouldn't be arguing, we shouldn't be debating, right? But that's really not taken in full context. Just a couple of verses above that is um, in, in verse 15, I think, is where uh, Paul is saying to study to show yourself approved. So the context is that we need to know the word of God. And then, yes, he said, avoid foolish and ignorant, ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. But the rest of that verse, as it ends, the following two verses says, 
able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So, to, to just pull out part of that verse and say, well, we shouldn't be arguing, I agree that arguing and bickering is not what we're called to do, but we are called in the rest of that verse, it says that we are to be able to teach and to point out where false doctrine has come in, okay? Um, giving a solid argument for, for believing the word of God is not the same as being argumentative. There are undoubtedly Christians who have used apologetics in very harsh ways to, to try and hammer a belief over somebody. There's no love, there's no relationship behind that argument, and that's not the way we're called to do it at all. But knowing the word, knowing the reasons why you believe it, and, and presenting that in a loving and relational way with someone is, is not only... I mean, it's clearly back by the Word of God. It's what we're called to do. So sometimes it means getting into debates. Like I debated with my, my friend, and throughout that debate, over and over, he kept saying, you know, I love you. I'm not angry. I said, I'm not angry either. Like, we're good. This is just us, you know, hashing out what we believe and, and me trying to show you why I believe what I believe. So um, definitely we need to do it out of love and kindness, but we also need to handle the word of God properly with fear because this is the word of God and we cannot compromise on what it says but we need to present it in a loving manner. The Bible is, is full of examples of apologetics and, and Paul was, I, I'd say without a doubt, one of the greatest uh, apologists throughout the Bible. Um, if you look at the Gospels alone, the way that they're written, I mean these these are eyewitness accounts given to present a reason to, that it's that we can believe that Jesus was not just another man that came and lived on earth, but he was God in the flesh, come to save us. His miracles attested to that, and recording them and sharing them with people was a form of apologetics. Um, in Acts, uh, Paul, so Acts, chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, um, we see that Paul debated often. Okay? It says, Now, when they had passed through uh, Am Amphipolis and Apollon Apollonia, I don't know, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a young, or where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, went into them for, and for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. I know we have church in this format, where one person comes up and speaks what God has placed in his heart, and I've had I, I've learned a lot over the years from listening to preachers, but this is not the only example given. Uh, what, what we see with Paul, and there was a, there's another passage I think it's uh, in chapter 18 where it says that um, he was he was trying to reason with them, and some he refused to believe. So then he set up outside, and for for two years preached and, and reasoned in the sense that he, he discussed with people and he <clears throat> presented his arguments and had open forum like discussion, okay? um, which is something that I'm a, a lot more comfortable with is, is back and forth discussion than just standing here. But um, it, it was good to have that back and forth. Everybody should be involved and everybody, because, uh, because as you guys, as you are able to then defend what you believe in and reason out in your mind, it strengthens you and provides, um, it, it, it gives you faith and helps build your faith, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and it's, 
it's not just to reach those who uh, are unbelievers, but obviously it also helps build their faith. As I was just saying, when you look in, in Luke chapter 7, you see John the Baptist who had been arrested and put in prison. Okay, verses 19 through 22, it, it talks about how he, he sends some of his uh, disciples to go and see and ask, is Jesus the real, is this the one that we're expecting or should we, we be looking for another? And Jesus didn't answer and say, well, why don't you have faith? You know, like, of course it's me. Right. He said, he, he was at that time healing people. And he said, look at the people who are blind who have been healed. The people who, have, who are deaf and are now hearing. He pointed to the miracles that he was providing and said, go back and tell uh, John what you see. Because those proofs helped build John's faith in a moment of uh, maybe doubt or at least when he was down because he was in prison. And so that proof of who God was helped build uh, John's faith. You'll often hear um, people bring up this comment that you can't argue or reason someone into heaven. And so for that reason, apologetics is, is pointless or, or not the way that we should approach it. But I would ask, can you love someone into heaven? Can you pray them into heaven? Can you do enough good works for somebody that they're going to go to heaven? And the answer is no. God must draw each person to him. And um, John, John 6, 44 tells us it's that God draws us to him. And that no man can come to the Father unless he draws him to him. But that doesn't mean that we stop praying for lost in our world. It doesn't mean that we stop loving them or that we stop uh, serving them and, and providing for them. And so we also should not stop pres presenting our reasons for our faith to them. God created us in his image, and that image includes the fact that we have reasoning and intelligence which is not seen in any other creation. Okay, We are able to use the reasoning and the intelligence, intelligence that God gave us to understand the things of this world and point us towards God. Uh, Romans chapter 1 says, uh, just one second, I think I'm jumping ahead, I have it elsewhere in my notes, but uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We are able to see God in the world around us, and, and that points us to him. Uh, and also... And, and, and also we sometimes have to use that to, to set straight things that are wrong in the church in June. Uh, verses 3 to 4, um, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, this is what he wanted to write about, our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. To contend means to, 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 to fight for, to... to <clears throat> Basically, what I've been talking about with, with apologetics is to, to really dig in and, and give the reasons for to to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God um, and our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is that people have crept in and they're, they're teaching this uh, sort of hyper grace message that grace covers everything so you don't need to worry about what you've done and and grace does cover our sins I'm definitely not opposing that but that doesn't give us free agency to just ignore the rest of what God has told us and directed us to do Uh, so when we are looking at providing our, our reasons for our faith, there are many extra-biblical sources that we can use, and we, 
we look at history, archaeology, and even science, they all support the Bible. Um, archaeologists have often, throughout, his, throughout time, looked at things in the Old Testament, like kingdoms and kings, and said, well, we don't have any record of that. That doesn't exist because it, you know, it's not in our history, so the Bible just made that up. And then when they go and they, they excavate and they look in these areas, they, they find these cities and they find records of these kings because the Bible is, is also a real rec, uh, recording of history. It's, it's not exclusively a history book. The Bible is so much more can be categorized into just one thing, but history confirms the Bible. Archaeology confirms the Bible. And unlike many believe, science actually supports the Bible. Science is the study, of us trying to study to our, our surroundings to understand how things work. And of course the Bible would support, or science would support the Bible because God made all the scientific laws. He, you know, he created gravity and we're able to experience that and, and see that in real life. He, he created all the laws that our world um, exists by. So science doesn't disprove the Bible when you actually look at it. It, it definitely supports the Bible. The world has concluded that they're smarter than God, that they don't need God, okay? and, and has therefore fully accepted things like evolution and, and uh, Big Bang, not needing creation, not needing God. But, but the Bible says, um, let's see, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 to 19, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So even though the world has accepted and, and teaches in our schools now that evolution is basically fact, or they, they would call it the theory of evolution, but they're largely standing on that being fact, the Bible tells us something different. We need to understand that there's scientific um, evidence. That evidence is the same evidence that, that Christians use, um, but we have a different worldview. We see the world through the Bible and we understand that. And we are able to use that same evidence that they say disproves the Bible, but to actually support what the Bible says happened. The, the flood, the whole thing, it is supported when, when we look at these evidences through the lens of the Bible. Um, and, and that is actually, without going into full depth, creation apologetics is somewhere that God has really pointed me and, and that I love to, to research. This is where actually I had Romans chapter 1 in there, that through, through creation God points out um, his, his invisible attributes and that we can find God through him. But of course, Satan would want to distort the creation account. If, if Romans is telling us that through the creation, we are able to see that God is real, and that we're able to see his invisible attributes, then of course, Satan would want to, to tear that down and teach that creation is, is false, and that evolution is how we came to be. So even though we can use extra biblical um, science, history, uh, sources, and stuff like that. What we need to understand is that ultimately the Bible is our authority yeah. and everything has to come back and go through the Word of God. Even the things that we may not be able to understand and we look at as you know, I can't reconcile this, I don't understand. The Bible is true. God has proven it by sending His Son. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We are sometimes accused of just having blind faith when we rely on the Bible, when we turn to the Bible. You just, you just have blind faith. You can't, you can't back that. But it's not a blind faith. We must have faith in the Bible, but it is reasoned faith. God gave us reasoning so that we can understand, and he gave us the evidence that we can 
look to to reason for our faith, but it's still faith in the Word of God. Um, and if we decide that any portion of Scripture is not true, for example, let's look at creation just briefly. If we say, yeah, I believe the Bible, the Bible is true, but Genesis, the beginning, the first ten chapters of creation and the fall and the uh, I just can't believe that that doesn't seem real. And we take that portion of the Bible out, we undermine the full foundation because every part of the word works together. And you, you can't just chip out what you don't like and say, well, I don't have to believe that, but I believe the rest. Uh, basically, every main principle of, uh, of the Bible finds its foundation in Genesis, okay? Not just how we were created, but how marriage was designed. Sex. Uh, like gender, um, all of this is, is laid out in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. And so if we allow that that foundation to be eroded away, we are giving up ground and losing our foundation. Right. Um, so all, all scripture can be traced back through through Genesis, but like really back and forth on top of each other, so we must stand on it all. Um, and and then some people try to combine them and mix them. Okay, so we have this idea of a theistic evolution because we don't want to give up the idea that evolution existed, but we also want to try and have God in there. We try to say, okay, well then maybe God created through evolution and mixing the scripture with man's wisdom or, or understanding never worked. We must rely solely on what the Bible says. Deistic evolution requires that although God used evolution that that, that that God created, he created through evolution. That means that there was death and disease and sickness for years until Adam and Eve came along. And that's not what the Bible tells us. If that sin existed from the beginning, then when God created and then used evolution for it, would mean that God created something that was not good. And that's not what he did. He created a perfect world and he allowed us. Sin comes about because of our free will. And that free will is so that we can choose God. So, And that's really what I wanted to say. So, um, so sort of seems a little abrupt ending there. But ultimately we just need to learn know that we have a reason for our faith and that is founded in the word of God that we stand on the word of God fully and and understand why give so we are able to tell people because I've had many opportunities like with my friend but also people at work I, I for whatever reason God seems to like to provide people for me to debate with and they are good healthy debates loving relational debates but he gives me this opportunity all the time to give the reasons for what I believe, not just tell people what I believe, which is very important, but why I believe. So, thank you. I guess I'll just close in prayer. Lord, I thank you that you have given us reasoning and wisdom, Lord, that you have created us above all other creatures, that we are able to understand who you are. I pray that you would drive each and every one of us, each and every one of us to dig deeper into your word and to understand what you've done for us, why you've done it, Lord, and, and to be able to use that wisdom, that knowledge, to be able to teach people about you so that they could understand you. Because one of the big issues that people always have is why. Now, I don't just want to know what the Bible says. I want to know why God would do this, Lord. And we can study and find those reasons in you and be able to give a reason to, for our faith, Lord. I thank you for that. In your name, amen.